Thank you, Suresh. Um, thank you very much for the organizers for inviting me here to this lovely and stimulating conference in a beautiful part of the world. So I will be speaking today about um, some joint work with Clara Aldana concerning the zeta regularized determinant. OK, so what is this thing? So the setting will be quite simple. So the singular setting is, I think, the most singular setting there is. And that is the setting of corners in Euclidean domains. So the general setup. Piecewise smooth boundary, bounded domain in the plane, and we're going to take Dirichlet boundary condition. For my Laplace equation. And so then we know that the spectrum doesn't start at zero. And then forms a monotonically well, increasing, uh, not strictly increasing per se, sequence. And the first important fact, in case we have forgotten, is the theorem by Weil, who proved it, in fact, in precisely this setting, that the limit, as k goes to infinity, of 4 pi k divided by lambda k times, I will use this to denote the area of the domain, is equal to 1. OK, so this tells us, ah, yes, I have exercises sprinkled throughout this talk. Yes, they're, they're mostly rather elementary. So they're for your entertainment and engagement. Pardon? Perhaps. If so, it will be a pop quiz. So this is the first exercise. Prove that this zeta function is holomorphic. On the half plane, real part of S is greater than 1 in C. Oh, I guess that's as far as they go. Oh, yes, and I, I have a. <laughs> Pardon? What's the dimension, Boris? Dimension over two, perhaps, which just happens to be? Oh, no. Yes. Yes. It's early. I know. It's OK. So to motivate the definition of the zeta regularized determinant, I have a naughty or formal exercise, which is to show that The determinant of the Laplacian, I'm going to put these in quotes, is this product. Now you see why there are quotes. OK, so this is a formal calculation. So this part, of course, makes no sense. But the right side does make sense which we shall see. So this is how one defines the zeta regularized determinant. Now, 
Now, it is not, I, I believe it is not so obvious that this makes any sense at all. It certainly doesn't follow from exercise one. Okay, so, but we're getting there. So here's another exercise for you. So prove that for every S in C with real part greater than one, we have the following equality. Which for now I'm gonna write this way. Okay. Is there a question? Okay. Okay. So this is the key to demonstrating that one may define the determinant. Um, okay, so how exactly do we do that? So I'm going to introduce a little bit of notation. Okay, so the heat kernel it can be expressed in terms of an L2 orthonormal basis of eigenfunctions, uh, which I think you probably are already quite familiar with, as this sum. And due to a few authors, um, it, well, it goes back perhaps farther than this, but... All oh, right, I have to use the plus. No, I think it's a good idea. And it's easier than an ampersand. Okay, so the heat kernel admits a short time asymptotic expansion as t goes to zero. I mean, the trace. Well. In certain settings, the heat kernel has a local expansion as well. Um. Okay, so the expansion is of this form where Again, that's the area, this is the perimeter. I will tell you what A2 is in a moment. And the remainder term is at least as good as uh, the order square root of T. So, if you want to prove this, basically you use the fact that the heat kernel is local for small times. So if it's quite hot over here, over here doesn't really feel it. And you can use the first two terms are actually, this inspires me, spontaneously gives you another exercise. Okay, the first part is very easy. Use the heat kernel for R2 to compute the first term. Slightly less trivial is to use the heat kernel for the upper half plane. Integrate over a little rectangle, I recommend. That's the shape of choice. To compute the second term. And the star part of the exercise is compute A2. Okay. So we use this expansion together with the expression of the zeta function in terms of the trace of the heat kernel, uh, well, the Mellon transform of the trace of the heat kernel, 
to express the zeta function like this, basically. So essentially what you do is, well, I'll write the proof in a moment. You split things into three pieces. The last piece is entire. The next piece is not problematic to the right of minus a half. And this piece is just sitting there rather explicitly for you. So you get this by Putting the integral into three parts and treating each part separately. So this leads me to the next exercise. The first part is to prove that indeed the formula for the determinant that I gave you is well defined. In other words, by the way, so we first do this for, obviously, real part of s greater than 1, and then we use the expression that we get to show that it is regular at s equals 0, therefore we can define zeta of 0, zeta prime of 0, and hence the determinant. So the first part, OK, I've already really done it for you. But now I have a question. What is zeta of 0? It's not totally explicit. Luke? C'est quoi? C'est comment? Non, mais il y a quelque chose sur la table? A2, I think I heard it. That's right. OK. So for a, let me give you the example of a polygonal domain, because this is a big part of the motivation here. So So if I have a polygonal domain with corner angles, and by that I mean interior angles, theta 1 up to theta n, then my a2, which is my zeta of 0, is precisely equal to a lovely, simple formula. Salut. OK. So it's given by the sum over the angles pi squared minus theta k squared divided by 24 pi theta k. And so what we really want to know is zeta prime of 0. We have a beautiful, cute formula for zeta of 0. Zeta prime of 0 is a bit harder to get a handle on. But some people can do this. So now I want to switch to slides. Uh, I need to write one other small thing on the board. Perhaps I can do this right here. All oh, right. 
Hands off. It's just a small thing. So this is for the setup. Okay, so the setup is one has classically a smooth closed surface. One considers a conformal family of metrics. How did I write them? Depending upon a parameter. And we have this lovely relationship because we're in 2D. Between the Laplacian on the original metric and the Laplacian for the conformally uh, equivalent metric. And Polyakov's, right, and we also have then that, the variation of the Laplacian with, to, with respect to this So one can use this fact to determine a formula for the derivative of uh, the determinant, where the derivative is taken with respect to variation within a conformal class. Okay, so how do I do this? I have to start at the beginning now. Okay. So. Okay, so Polyakov's formula, um, which I believe this one is due perhaps to Alvarez, this precise formula here, is for exactly this setting, and I want to make a very big point that these conformal factors are smooth. Okay. And so it gives the variation of the logarithm of the determinant, which as we know is zeta prime at zero, um, in terms of nice, computable local quantities. Okay, so I wanted to mention the work of some of my colleagues here who aren't speaking, which has been a big inspiration to both Clara and myself. Um, so, Alexi is an expert on the Polyka formula for surfaces with conical singularities that in particular arise as the boundary of a connected polyhedron in R3. And so he proved a Polyakov formula in this setting. So what's impressive is, of course, that the surface is not smooth. It has conical singularities. But nonetheless, he obtained a formula relating to smooth conformal metrics on such a surface. So if you want to know more about this formula, then I direct you to Alexei. Um, now, even more impressive is that he and for genus one, Julia, uh, Julia Klotschko, um, and then later for all genuses, computed an actual formula for the determinant. So, and then I wanted to mention his joint work with Luke. Um, they have done lots of interesting things together. Um, I've have not had time to thoroughly read through the spectral determinants on Mandelstam diagrams, but that looks quite, quite interesting. And we also have a lot of inspiration from the work of a couple of physicists. I call it spiritual inspiration, perhaps formal inspiration would also be good. Um, so this, this object, by the way, zeta prime of zero, is not very obviously computable. That's why I called this computing the uncomputable. Okay, so the first result that we have shows how um, if you vary the 
opening angle of a circular sector, the zeta regularized determinant depends upon that variation. And what we'll see is that there's two difficulties we have to overcome. One is geometric in the presence of the corner, which is the conical singularity. And the second is that in order to express the variation as a conformal change of metrics, it is necessary to have a conformal factor which is singular. So there's an analytic singularity and a geometric singularity, both occurring at the same time. OK. So this tells us that nonetheless, though, we were able to obtain a formula which is similar to the classical formula in that the variation of the determinant depending upon the angle is given by, in our case, the finite part of this integral, which has an expansion as t goes down to zero. And so it's the t to the zero part of that expansion. Right, and we don't care about the radius because that's another exercise for you, is to determine how the determinant depends upon variation of the radius. As a small hint, that's equivalent to simply scaling. So that's a pretty... The other corners aren't interesting because they're 90 degrees? Because the conformal factor is smooth there. Yeah. And because they don't really play a role for our big goal. So we have computed what this actually is, this finite part, for the special case of a circular sector of opening angle pi over 2. Um, but we have only computed the contribution from the corner, because this is this corner, because this is what we're eventually interested in. And as with the formula for zeta of zero for polygons, you see that it only depended on the angles. And our formula here, it has some constants in it, but the interesting part is this contribution is independent of the radius of the sector. So we have a purely local contribution coming from this corner um, in the variation of the determinant. OK, so now where's Alex? There's Alex. I have a conjecture with Clara, but actually, you can blame it on me. And that is that among all convex n-gons of fixed area, similar to the case for closed surfaces, the regular one uniquely maximizes the determinant. Now, the second exercise here is a bit difficult, so you can ask Alex. Um, and Alex's conjecture is that our conjecture is false. In particular, that it may hold for n equals 3 and 4, maybe 5, but it appears to be false for n greater than or equal to 12. So I'm curious how this is going to end up. OK. And the last result is that, well, if we look at just rectangular domains, then the determinant is uniquely maximized for the square. So our ultimate goal is to compute, to actually obtain a closed formula in the spirit of the formula for zeta of zero, for zeta prime of zero, um, by the steps are, first, we need to understand how changing angles changes the determinant. Second, we need to understand how changing lengths, because of course, in a polygon, you can't change angles independently of each other. They're all connected. So we use this schwarz christoffel mapping um, in the spirit of Aurel and Solomon's and to determine the variation of the side lengths. We obtain a variational formula. We integrate back. We use the example of the rectangle to get the formula for, for the polygon. Okay. So now I want to discuss a bit of how we do these things. So the goal, I, we
We want to prove a formula for, or understand, Okay, so I want to understand the dependence on, according to the angle of the sector. So the first part, I want to vary the angle, okay? But I, in order to take derivatives of operators, which is what one obviously has to do here, the operators need a common domain. So how can I turn changing the angle of the sector into this problem living on a fixed geometric domain? Well, quite simple. We embed the geometry into the, into the medic, metric. So we fix a sector. And there's tons of technicalities. So the first one is that I fix some sector beta s beta, where beta is greater than alpha. Alpha is the sector at which we differentiate. And alpha will be between 0 and pi. And we define a map. So alpha is fixed, beta is fixed, gamma is what I use for the angular parameter, which varies. So first, we, t we define a map phi from q to s gamma, defined by basically a change of coordinates. And we use this to define a conformal family of metrics. namely the pullback under this map phi. Which in the polar coordinates row theta on uh, Q looks like this, and our sigma gamma uh, does it Looks like this. So the first part is fine. Second part is problematic. So it is this logarithm, which is obviously singular as rho goes to zero, which has to be very. So this means that the techniques that work for the smooth cases, both smooth domains and or smooth smooth surfaces, smooth boundaries, smooth conformal factors, we can't use any of them here. So we have to do everything by hand. So we start, so we consider this fixed domain with this conformal family of metrics on it. And then we have um, Laplacians here. where, of course, our map psi gamma induces a map on smooth, compactly supported functions in the obvious way. And so first, we show that the domains of our operators translate nicely under these maps. And they are sort of what you expect. OK. But there's a problem. So the problem is that the domains of the operator depend on gamma. 
So if you want to differentiate a family of operators, they should all live on the same Hilbert space. But these don't. Um, so, we use a slightly different formulation of the domain. And here's where the B spaces come in. So instead, we write the space as R squared H2B intersect H10. And this will be useful for relating the domains of the different uh, H gammas. So to get you to see what I mean, if you take a function that looks like rho to the x, I threw a sign in there for fun. Prove that this is in L2, if and only if, x is greater than minus gamma over beta, h1, if and only if, x is greater than 0, h2, x has to be greater than gamma over beta. So this shows you that these spaces very heavily depend on the angle gamma, and that is a problem. But one shouldn't give up there. So we next introduce a map. Phi gamma. Which goes from Q, now I'm going to write the area form explicitly. So L2 on Q with respect to the area form corresponding to the metric H gamma to L2 of Q with its original measure. And this is an isometry. And so now we define it's basically we're making a little operator sandwich so that we can solve our problem. So we let H gamma be this operator, this nice operator sandwich. And then we have the following results. So now H gamma is going to be acting on these spaces with a fixed, so we have a fixed domain and we have a fixed measure. And the proposition is that the domain of H gamma is contained in rho to the 2 gamma over beta H2B of QDA intersect H10. And the next part, which is extremely important, is that our domains nest. So if gamma is larger than gamma prime, then the domain of H gamma is contained in the domain of H gamma prime. So these are basically straightforward things to, to demonstrate. It's simply a computation. And I should note that for technical reasons, we're always taking gamma greater than or equal to beta. So this, all of these are contained in rho squared H2B intersect H10. Okay, so we can almost differentiate. We could at least take one-sided derivatives, and that's precisely what we do. 
So we use the nesting of the domains to take one-sided derivatives and then show using the denseness of smooth functions, so I'll call this a lemma, the variation of H gamma, depending upon gamma, is the variation of the conformal factor plus a little sandwich with the variation of the Laplacian. And last term. So the proof is to, to compute one-sided derivatives, uh, and then in the case where we can only apply one of the operators but not the other, use the denseness of C0 infinity and show that if we take an approximating sequence, the result is independent of the approximating sequence and equals this applied to an element in the domain uh, for which I want to differentiate. So the next step is we have to differentiate the trace. And since I have all these different spaces going around, I have to use a bit of annoying notation, saying which space I'm taking the trace on. Okay, so we get a formula for how to differentiate the trace, and essentially the proof uses Duhamel's formula and estimates to prove that everything involved, all these maps and derivatives and all of that, are trace class, so that it's not purely formal, but it, it actually is defined and everything, the trace actually exists. Um, okay, so then, Note that this variation, as I mentioned before, is given by minus two times the variation of the conformal factor. And this is one of the reasons why using a conformal family is so important, first, firstly, and secondly, why being in two dimensions is so important, because one can compute the derivative of the operator using a conformal family and using the fact that it's conformal in dimension two. So then we obtain the formula for, first of all, we just differentiate the zeta function with respect to the parameter. Later, we will take the derivative at s equals zero. So when we do this at the angle at which we, we want to compute, we get the trace and then we get the variation of the conformal factor. And how do we get a DDT? Where does that come from? Well, this comes from the heat equation. Up to the factor of two. This comes from differentiating the operator, okay? And so we have this Laplacian, and then we have the same heat kernel. Okay, so this gives us a DDT, and what's the beauty of that? Well, if everything converges, then we can integrate by parts, and that will give us an S. 
And that S is very crucial because it gives us a double zero at S equals zero. So, um, yes. So then after the integration by parts, we get our formula. So we get 2s over gamma of s. Now we get a t to the s minus 1, and then the same trace. And where is my... Okay. So finally, when we take the derivative and set s equal to 0, ah. So this is why um, I went to the effort of showing very precisely how you determine that the zeta function is regular at s equals 0, because it's the same idea here. So this, we show, has an asymptotic expansion as t goes to 0. So we can do the same thing and use the fact that we have a double zero here. And this is the difference between trying to compute the zeta function directly versus trying to compute its variation. When we compute the variation, we can do this trick of, oh, we have the heat kernel, we take the Laplacian of it, we get a DDT uh, because it's the heat kernel, we integrate by parts, we get an extra s. And that extra s is super important. So because of that extra s, when we take the derivative of an s equals 0, all we get, all that survives, is the t to the 0 term. OK? And so then we write this out, we turn everything back into our original sector, and we get the formula that I gave in the slide before. Um, so I'll write it down again. Okay, and our betas all go away, and anyways, I don't need to write the formula one more time. Um, questions at the moment? No? Okay, so I'll just give you a very brief sketch of how we prove theorem two. This is an exercise, perhaps. Yes, that's a good idea. Compute the finite part as t goes to zero. Um, of the following. 1 over pi squared t, integrate up to r, but r is actually going to be independent. Well, the finite part will be independent of that r. 1 plus log r times 1 plus e to the minus r squared on t minus e to the minus r squared on 2t, 1 minus cosine of 2 phi, uh, minus e to the r squared on 2t times 1 plus the cosine r d r d phi. OK, so it's fun with special functions. 
And finally, how to prove the result for rectangles. It's quite cute. So, you know since kindergarten, that in this case you have a nice formula for the zeta function. It's m squared pi squared over L squared plus N squared pi squared L squared to the minus S, okay? And then you can compute that zeta prime of zero is then equal to minus two log of the data, uh, eta dedic eta Dedekind function, uh, evaluated i over l squared, plus log l, plus log two. And you also know that zeta l of s is equal to zeta one over l of s, because by hypothesis, the dimensions are l times one over l. And so then you show that Basically, this function looks like this. Here's one. The derivative is zero there. It goes up this way. It goes up that way. So you have a unique minimum for this. So therefore, when you put it back into the determinant, you have a unique maximum, because the determinant is e to the minus zeta prime at zero. OK. Any questions?